of School Growth, and we're excited to be able to share with you an interview with Steve Robinson, the president of the Southern Association of Independent Schools, uh, which is headquartered in uh, near Atlanta, Georgia. And Steve works with schools uh, throughout the Southeast, and I know has worked with schools all around the world in helping them devise strategies for growth and for uh, and for uh, improving the qualities of their board as well as their academic programs and and uh, really just developing schools of, of excellence. And so we've asked Steve to join us as a part of our series uh, this month on how to improve the uh, process of assessment and, and improving the, the quality of the relationship between uh, the chief administrator of the school and the school board because we know that that relationship is so vital to the, the, uh, the, the growth of the school and uh, the the, uh, the development of the maturity of the of the board as well. So, uh, Steve, thanks for joining us here this afternoon. Well, thank you, Scott. I'm happy to be with you. Yeah. So you've uh, you've published a paper. I know that's up on on your uh, your blog uh, up on uh, drsteverobinson.wordpress.com. And uh, uh, tell us a little bit about the motivation behind that paper and what you're seeing right now in terms of the trends of uh, head of school evaluation. Well, one of the reasons that I uh, published it was because it was something that boards were asking about, uh, and also something that in my work with boards, I, I uh, uh, genuinely feel that uh, boards are not always clear on, uh, first off, the importance of their, their role as an evaluator of the head, and, and then secondly, uh, the best process to go about that evaluation. And so as a part of uh, SAIS's board training and governance uh, training for our schools, uh, it was one of those pieces of information that was uh, uh, appropriate to publish at the time and, and is used on a regular basis when I'm uh, uh, passing information along to boards. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. So when when you're when you're coaching a, a board, obviously you've worked with boards uh, th throughout the the country and especially in the southeast. What what are some of the the best practices then that you have seen in terms of that uh, that evaluation process? Well, the the important thing about an evaluation process and, and uh, is seen in in good processes and, and with good boards that take it seriously is that. The evaluation focuses on things that are pertinent or relevant to the head of school's job as a head of school or the chief uh, administrator's job as a, as a chief administrator hmm. and uh, does not drift off into um, uh, kind of peripheral kinds of uh, uh, discussions and ideas and, you know, uh, the head of school wore a, a color of tie at the ball game that uh, was the same color <laughs> as the opposing team, and you know those kinds of things. And it's amazing how how really smart people that are on boards and very well intentioned boards, when they sit around a table and just say, "Well, what do you think of the head of school?" All of these little things that come up. So it needs to be mm. very focused. It needs to be intentional, and it needs to be built on expectations. And, and remain on expectations uh, so that uh, it, uh, it, it does what it's supposed to accomplish, and that is help the head be better and help the school be better. Sure, that makes sense. So in that area of expectations, obviously, uh, everybody kind of comes to that, that role on the board, especially when the board is dominated with parents. They come to that with sort of their own experiences there of, of what the school should look like and what the, what the head of school should look like. You mentioned the tie at the ball game, uh, whether they should be wearing a suit or they should be more casual or, or whether they should be smiling or whether they should be serious or, you know, everybody's got these different expectations. Uh, you, Focus is, I agree with you, I think focus is really important to give the head of school uh, clear direction and um, the ability to kind of to get through uh, all the, 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 the variances of the different board's opinions. How does a board really craft those expectations in, to, to give focus? I mean, what are, what are the things that a board should or should not do in order to really uh, give that head of school, you know, some energizing focus? Yeah. Well, well it, it, Scott, it has to be, um, as I said before, it has to be intentional. And I believe it has to be built on a, on a consistent time frame because ultimately the board one of their primary roles as fiduciaries of the school 
is to hire, support, evaluate, and when necessary, terminate the head of school or the chief academic officer. Um, and so it should not be something that they just walk into and, and do on the spur of the moment. So you build a structure for what that looks like. You collect the data you need to collect, and you have the conversations with the board that remain very focused on not only how did the how was performance this year based on last year's goals, and what should be our goals for next year uh, that we ask the uh, the head of school to accomplish. So really, it, it, it's a, it's a simple. I say it's simple. It's, it's never simple because, you know, for the board, they need to speak as one voice. And uh, I often say that a board head relationship is like a marriage, but always one of the partners has multiple personalities and it makes it a little more challenging. So, uh, but to be intentional, to be, uh, to work on a regular cycle, to understand what it is that is appropriate to evaluate. And the other thing that is very important is to understand there is no person on earth that could be fully liked by everyone else. It's not an issue if one of the board members really doesn't like the personality because that's not what you're evaluating. Uh, you're evaluating their effectiveness as a head of school based on the constructs that you've established, the evaluation uh, uh, points that you've established, and apart from something illegal, or unethical or moral turpitude uh, that might cause a, a, a discipline or a termination in, in mid-year or something. Apart from that, uh, the board should stick with what do we expect, communicate those expectations, and evaluate on those points only. Got it. In your uh, blog post on uh, drstevrobinson.wordpress.com, you, you use that term construct uh, uh, explicitly. Why, why did you choose that word? Well, because I'm, I'm really talking in terms of, of the, uh, the essence of that which the board is wanting to look at. And for example, um, it is appropriate for a board to tell a head of school that one of the things we're going to hold you accountable for is for teacher morale. Uh, if that happens to be one that is important, and, and it may not be uh, given the time, and you know, if the board asks the head to do a bunch of dirty work by making some cuts, they can't expect teacher morale to be as high as it would. But let's say it's teacher morale, and, and that is a construct, an understanding of teacher morale, which is hard to measure, but we all kind of have an idea of what that might look like. And so the board needs to, based on the school's mission, uh, you know, the, all schools have slightly different missions, very similar, but based on the mission, and the board needs to understand the mission, identify those areas that are important to be, to evaluate on that you are going to set goals for the head. And uh, so it's, it's really a construct is just simply a, a common understanding around something uh, that is not as tangible as and quantitative maybe a, a, as some things are. So faculty morale, parent satisfaction, student satisfaction, uh, leadership, those are, those are constructs that we can evaluate but uh, um, they, they and can set goals for heads but they need to be clearly understood, clearly articulated and defined before they become a goal that uh, a head of school will be evaluated on. Makes sense. And you mentioned in your in your article about uh, they really have to not only set learn you know set the right goals, but then have a reliable and valid process for uh, collecting data and and then assessing the the achievement of those goals. Right. Well, one of the common uh, uh, mistakes uh, or or. Uh, uh, deviations from best practice that I, I see boards do. And again, I, I, I work with probably 50 and 50 board workshops or retreats a year. I work with a lot of boards and I don't know that I've ever seen a board or board members within a board that overwhelmingly have bad intentions. Boards all come to the table because they want to help the school. They want, they want the best for the school and so on and so forth. But one of the things that is, um, that is fairly common is they, they administer assessments or they do evaluations uh, that become de facto evaluations of the head by other groups. 
it's important to understand the only, the only entity that evaluates the head is the board. Teachers don't evaluate the head. Parents don't evaluate the head. The board evaluates the head. Now, it's very appropriate to say faculty morale is a construct you want to, to measure. But when you measure that, you don't do it in a way that sends a, a survey to faculty and say, help us evaluate the head. What you do is you identify an assessment method, whether it be a, a survey, whether it be focus groups, whether it be interviews, whatever it might be, a, a valid assessment uh, method that gets specifically at the construct of how is the morale with the faculty. And then when you get that information, you bring that back to the board, that is put into the mix of the overall board discussion and evaluation. Mm -hmm. And from that multiple assessments, possibly of, uh, of uh, uh, various constructs, you will come to the table and then the board assesses that and makes the evaluation. Uh, I, I think it can be my personal opinion, and I know some would disagree with me, my personal opinion for, for heads of school um, to be evaluated by all of the constituents, uh, and I've seen that happen a lot, where it's actually sent out, head evaluation to the faculty. Uh, I think it, it, it creates a situation um, that is, first off, inappropriate because no one evaluates the head but the board. Uh, as fiduciaries of the school. And secondly, I, I don't think you always get the best information from the faculty if they think what they're going to say is going to influence the head of school's evaluation, either for good or bad. If they, right. if they want to protect the head, they may be much kinder than would be real. And if they uh, have something against the head, they may be much harder. So I'm not saying in which direction, but I, I think it skews their responses a bit, other than just saying, how good do you feel about your job? How supported sure. do you feel by the school administration and so on and so forth? Well, if you look at some of the data that's uh, <clears throat> published by Harvard Business Review and uh, some other pretty reliable sources that you, know, you have to be very careful how you do a 360 review if you're going to, uh, to make that data, you know, the key word that you used in your, in your article is, is valid. Right. And to have valid 360 data really takes a lot of work. And I, I think that the way that the, the many boards use a 360 review, it actually ends up being a demotivating, disruptive process as opposed mm -hmm. to a constructive, really enabling the vision process. Right. Well, I agree. And, I, and again, I, I'm not going to, to argue with a lot of people that are smarter than I am about uh, 360 reviews, and I know there are people, particularly in the corporate world, and I can envision that being appropriate at certain levels uh, within, uh, for example, an administrative team having each of them evaluate each other mm -hmm. in, in a circle uh, or whatever. But if you stop and think about it, first off, the only entity that is charged with evaluation of the head, and that is their role, and only their role, is the board as a whole, not individual board members, they contribute to the overall uh, evaluation of the head. But it's often that in a school, the head will have to do some dirty work mm -hmm. that they can't tell people about because of confidentiality and so on and so forth. And so, you know, whether it be a termination, whether it be a dismissal of a student, whether it be a reduction in staff, a lot of things that the board and the head know have to be done, and it's the head's job to go do it. And in those situations when people don't have all of the information that the board has as to why the head is behaving this way, it, it, it makes the data certainly not reliable, and if it's not reliable, it can't be valid. Um, uh, it's not reliable data because they're reacting from their impression uh, on certain things a at the same time they don't know all of the backstory and so there are just a lot of problems I'm not saying it could never be done uh, effectively certainly uh, I, I recognize that there may be some usefulness and I've even heard of heads that have asked for 360s of types but as you said Scott it, it is something that has to be done extremely carefully and extremely well and uh, as a rule, I would suggest, let's develop assessments for those constructs that are important, academic achievement, 
uh, uh, community perception, whatever those constructs might be, let's find a way to assess those, bring that assessment to the table, and then the board as a whole make the overall evaluation based on that and set goals going forward. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, this is Scott Bear with school, with school Growth. We're visiting with Steve Robinson, the president of SAIS. And so, Steve, when you when you look at the boards where uh, the the head has been in place for uh, you know longer term, and what we have seen in our research that where the head is in place a, a, a minimum of, of about a little over a little under eight years, the school is able to really achieve a level of greatness than you can with a head in place for a shorter term. Uh, so when you look at the long the schools that have had a, a head in place for the long term. Are there any specific characteristics that you have seen uh, them have in their relationship with their with their chief administrator? Uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, and I say something I say often to boards when I'm working with them is I've never seen an excellent school that doesn't have an excellent board. Amen. Uh, I, you can see some good schools that become good in spite of a, a board that's not excellent, but the schools that First off, if you look at the head board relationship, and for uh, a lack of a better uh, a metaphor, let's talk in terms of it being a marriage. Uh, you, you think about uh, for people that have uh, partners or spouses uh, have entered into marriages, they understand it takes work. Uh, communication is not always smooth. My wife is not always happy with me. Sometimes she even speaks harshly to me, believe it or not. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the marriage is broken. It does not mean that, that we're still not working for a common good. So if you think of a board and a head as a, as a, a relationship similar to a marriage, it's mostly about communication. It's having good lines of communication. Expectations uh, are, are clear and understood, and that's why an evaluation with clear expectations is so important because, you know, people aren't going to the end of the year wondering what are they going to talk about this year. They know what the evaluation's on. And, uh, and, and a free dialogue that allows for uh, uh, intellectual tension and allows for discourse uh, that may be tough at times, but people don't take it personally. Mm -hmm. This usually is accomplished by a board that is well trained, understands their role, and that they only have any authority when they act as a full board, and a board that uh, has selected a chair of the board that really understands and is good at this. Because most often the chair and the uh, chief, uh, uh, chief academic officer, I believe we're calling them in this discussion, where there are a lot of things to call them, but the chief academic officer and the board chair do most of the communication. Uh, and so it's important that the board chair be a good board chair and not just the person that was in line next to move up. The board also has to be intentional about who they make as their chief spokesperson to interact on this regular basis with the head because the success of, of, of the school is largely dependent upon a good relationship there. And it and it allows long term uh, uh, long term relationships. Again, I think it just compare it to a marriage yeah. or to a relationship. In that way, good communication gives you a greater chance for a longer sustainable relationship. So, are you seeing in the on the the more the higher functioning boards? Are you seeing the the chairman of the board uh, having a longer tenure? Uh, my my personal belief is that that is. The, that should be the case uh, as a rule. Now, obviously, if you have a chair that, that doesn't take the role seriously and is not about communicating and is out with a personal agenda, then you want that to be as short as possible and move them on. However, right. um, I, I recommend to boards that they reconsider uh, uh, two year or less, particularly one year, and there are some that have one year turnovers. If it's even two years, I recommend that they really reconsider and have a longer term for the chair because often those communications don't develop just immediately. And even though one's been on the board and known the head and interacted with the head, it becomes a different relationship as the chair where you're meeting on a regular basis where uh, you're the first person the head calls to 
uh, FYI on something that they're doing and those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, my, my personal opinion is should be uh, three, maybe even five years, uh, three at a minimal. Um, but again, uh, I work with independent schools and the, the primary uh, value of independent schools is their independence and they get to choose that themselves. But I, I think more than a year or two is certainly beneficial in my estimation. Got it. And then what about looking again at those those uh, boards where they've been able to keep a longer term head and they have they seem to have a higher degree of performance. Is there an average size that you're seeing that is consistent among those boards? Um, well, I don't uh, I, I don't think that um, I mean, an average size for the boards I work with would probably be somewhere around 17 or 18. Okay. Uh, I've seen uh, boards of uh, five and I've seen boards of 35, uh, maybe even larger than that. But uh, mm -hmm. probably 17 or 18 is pretty typical. I, I think more than size, it's really about the makeup of the board, who you put on the board, and does, does each board member understand their role and the appropriate role that they bring to the board um, uh, is more crucial than the size. Size can be beneficial if you have a lot of committee work uh, for schools that are engaged in a lot of different things and the board has multiple committees doing a lot of work. If you have five people, you have one committee that does everything. If you have 15 or 16, then you can break up into smaller committees. So really, I, I would say the size is just if it takes a larger board to get the representation you need and to do the committee work, that's great. Yeah. Um, I would recommend probably not more than 20 kind of max in my mind and, and uh, probably 10 is on the low side. So if you think in terms of 10 to 20, yeah. you're probably going to be okay in my estimation. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I noticed also in, in your article that you posted on your blog that you provided a board evaluation survey. Like mm -hmm. a sample of that. That, that, that was, uh, I like the way that you structured that. Uh, what, what was your intent? How, how should that best be used? Well, uh, what, what I wanted to do is when I, when I go through and, and explain to, to boards or in, in any situation what I think uh, the best approach is, uh, I'm always asked for, do you have a template? Do you have an idea? Mm. So the survey that I, that I have here actually is a survey that, um, uh, that we are in the process now at SAIS in the process of rolling out some surveys for our schools to use. Uh, we've just finished a reliability uh, testing on, on one of them, a uh, value survey. And this will likely be available, but a school could use this. It just gives them an idea of the areas that typically boards are interested in. It's not meant to be exhaustive. Uh, a school board could look at this and go, well, we have these expectations of heads. Well, that's okay as long as the head knows what those expectations are in advance and knows that's what they will be evaluated on and how they will be evaluated. But this is a survey that actually is designed to use with your board of trustees. And so you administer the survey to all of your trustees. The data comes in. Someone on the executive committee or the evaluation committee compiles the data and brings that to the meeting where the board is actually discussing the data from the board, discussing any external assessments, and arriving at a conclusion as to what the evaluation uh, outcome uh, should be. And then that it, the evaluation would be put together and usually presented to the head by the board chair um, after it's written up and such. But this is the, the survey designed for trustees to give their individual input on certain constructs and on certain areas that are, that are quite typical uh, for heads to be evaluated on. So mm -hmm. it's a template, a sample. Sure, makes sense. All right, great. All right, uh, so anything that you're seeing kind of uh, on the horizon, some exciting uh, uh, trends or around boards or around overall school leadership? Oh, wow. Uh, there are a lot of things uh, on the horizon, uh, it, it's likely. Um, one of the things that has changed, and this is not necessarily on the horizon, but uh, boards are just starting to come to grips with this. And in fact, heads are just start, heads of school are just starting to come to an understanding of this as well. That uh, a few years back, uh, many people uh, that will possibly hear this conversation remember a thing called Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, when that uh, 
the federal government got involved in uh, uh, regulating some uh, publicly traded companies. Um, what has happened over the last 11 years since Sarbox uh, was implemented is that Sarbanes-Oxley has become a de facto standard for nonprofits in the courts. So with that in mind, there are a couple of things that boards need to pay a little more attention to. The other, one of those things is that the separation of management and government governance is very important. Uh, some of the companies that got in trouble that, that caused this was because their boards were actually running the companies. And, and the, one of the principles is you separate your governance and your day-to-day -day management, which plays uh, in line with what we've always argued, that you hire a head to run the day-to-day. -day. But there are also some things like whistleblower policies and conflict of interest policies that come into play. But uh, the, the thing that I emphasize is that boards are just picking up on in a way that I think is important is that as a role as a, in a role as a board, they have fiduciary, they have a fiduciary role for the school. They are not a representative governance. They don't represent stakeholders outside the board. They don't represent parents, they don't represent students, and for sure they don't represent their own family's interests because that, that is one of the things that hurts uh, so much. Uh, you with betcha. Absolutely. So with fiduciary role and the fiduciary role, I'm not, I'm not an attorney, and, but from what I've read and from what I hear, a fiduciary role is one of the highest expectations that can be uh, placed on someone to look after others uh, good and after a trust and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So what it means is, is we're telling, we're reminding boards, you don't get on a board to come in and see what you can get done so, so you can fix things for your child to be in the school or all of the parents that are in your social club. Your sole focus is on what's best for the school. You're a fiduciary. What's best for the school today, next year, and into the future? And so I, I think for me, I'm starting to see boards comprehend and understand that role. And uh, so when you talk about mm. it on the horizon, I think that um, I think that's important uh, for them to know, and I really think that will change uh, the quality of schools that we have. If boards understand and get that, it will take care of so much of the problems that we have uh, with disruptions in schools. And so I know that's not a, a sexy kind of futuristic thing <laughs> that, uh, that uh, people often no, that's want important. to hear. You're right. But it, ha it has been a yeah. change over the last 10 years and not everyone has understood and made that change. And one last thing on that, and I, I'm rambling a little bit, but one last thing on that is that it's also a little bit of a, a, a change for heads of school to understand. Uh, so many heads of school, including myself when I was head of school, were raised with this notion from our mentors and the heads that had been down the road now, you just want to keep the board out of the way. You just want to let them hire you, tell them you'll call them when you need them, and you go run the school. Well, legally, a board would be fools to do that a Board, if they just never had accountability measures put in front of them. doesn't mean they go to the business officer and ask for the books and sit there and go, but they ask for the appropriate financial reports that the head will bring. They ask for the head to show how the curriculum that they've implemented, that the head has implemented in his team, how it is creating the results that they promise parents they'll have. So uh, for sometimes th there are heads that, that this is a little bit new, you know, it, it seems a little intrusive and I'm not in any way suggesting board should get in the day to day. But there should be a good communication, and the board has to be sure that they are taking care of their fiduciary role, or they could get in a, a fair amount of individual and personal trouble or liability uh, by negligence. Makes sense. Yeah, being a, being a member of a board is not just a, a, a privilege, it's a responsibility as well. And so you're right, and, and our, the, the best boards are taking that seriously. They're understanding that fiduciary responsibility and are really being proactive at building that relationship with their head of school and with each other to build right. a, a great board culture 
and a relationship with their chief administrator. So uh, we've been visiting with Steve Robinson here, the, the uh, president of SAIS, and Steve, we're just uh, so grateful for the chance to have uh, picked your brain a little bit about what you see happening with uh, the evaluation of school heads. There's, it's obviously uh, uh, continuing to, to evolve, and, and we're excited, to, like you, to be able to work with boards, to see them mature and grow, and because, we, you know, we it's hard for schools to grow if we don't have a board that's really committed to being a learning organization and to be their best. And so we thank you for what you do to see that happen as well among the independent schools that you work with. And we are excited about the continuing to work with you to see that happen in a, in a broad number of, of schools and, and to learn from you. So thanks so much for your, the article that you published. Thank you, Scott. We do encourage you to go and visit uh, Steve's blog out there, Dr. Steve Robinson at uh, .wordpress.com, and you can see more about what he's put there as well as the, the, the board survey. So thanks. We'll talk to you soon. Excellent. Thank you, Scott.